Welcome back to the morning show here on Arise News. The Labour Party governorship candidate in Delta State, Kempela, has said that Deltans will take their revenge against the People's Democratic Party, PDP, and the All Progressives Congress, APC, in the state. According to the Labour Party governorship candidate, both PDP and APC have oppressed Deltans for 24 years and have kept the state in poverty and penury, stealing and pillaging the Commonwealth of Deltans. Pella has vowed that if elected, he will turn the fortunes of the state around with his eight-point rebuilding and development plans by enthroning righteousness, harmony, and prosperity for all Deltans, and wipe away the 24 years of waste the state has been subjected to by the People's Democratic Party on account of failed promises. Joining us now from Abuja studio to discuss his ambition to become the next governor of Delta State is Deacon Kempela, Labour Party governorship candidate in Delta State. Good morning, Dick Kempela, and thank you very much for joining us on The Morning Show. Good morning. It's a pleasure to be here. Well, thank you very much. First, let's start on a note of clarification. Over the weekend, there was some story flying about, some people alleging uh, that uh, you are not qualified to run uh, in this race as a governorship candidate of your party for the simple reason that it is alleged you were indicted by an administrative panel of inquiry. And, that, and as a result, having been indicted, you, you have no strong basis uh, to say you still want to be governor of a better state. I'm not... I'm not too sure you are aware of this, but if you are aware of it, could you help us clarify and speak to it? Okay, thank you very much for that question. I, um, there's no truth in that allegation, and I've addressed it in various fora since it came to my attention. Um, I, and I say that um, if there's any truth in it, they should publish the indictment. There's no truth in it. What they're just doing is trying to distract the... The, the electorate um, from, from voting the way they, they see that the Labour Party is going to go, that the, the electorate is going to go. So there's no truth in that story at all. All right, um, Dickin Pella. So now that you're running, I would like to talk more about your eight-point agenda. You've spoken about this a number of times in terms of how you want to liberate Delta State from, as you've said, 24 years of bad leadership. Please share with us your plans. <clears throat> Okay, um, um, it's, it's, it, it's become, you know, they, they now say it's an eight-point agenda. However, it's a three-stage plan, okay? The vision is to build a better delta where righteousness, harmony, and prosperity reigns. Now, it's deeply rooted in the from consumption to production vision of our principle, but it's however localized, determining that the biggest problem in delta is that of the impunity that has reigned in the land. And so we are talking about enthroning righteousness. Righteousness here simply means doing the right thing. All right? And so we're looking at enthroning accountability and integrity, transparency in governance, fairness, equity, and justice in government, um, reorientating the values of our people, encouraging mass participation mass participation in government and eliminating waste and corruption in government. We believe that when we enthrone righteousness the way we have planned it, um, we will be able to create harmony, but we'll en enhance the security, the peace and harmony of the land by working with the federal government because we believe that Peter Obi will eventually become president. We will have federal, state, and community policing so we will put in place well-equipped um, state and community policing to enhance the security of our land. Now, when we do those two things, we are then able to create a situation or an environment where prosperity can thrive. But we won't just let it happen. We won't leave it to chance. We will engender prosperity. But before I talk about the eight key drivers of prosperity, let me say specifically, that most people will talk about building roads, healthcare, schools, 
those are typical things that our politicians will say. But there are things that are the right of the citizens. And so I won't promise that because I, it is what I owe the citizens. It's not a privilege. I will assure Deltans that they will have the best health care, the best roads, and the best education. What I promise also is to drive the economy of, of Delta, engender prosperity through eight key prosperity drivers. The first is that we will pay a living wage. All right, and what I mean by a living wage is that um, today, minimum wage is 30,000 Naira, which is 1,000 Naira a day. By the time you pay transport fare to work, you will not be able to pay um, school fees or house rent or so on. That is why corruption thrives in our land. So we we're going to progressively increase minimum wage to 100,000 Naira a month, and that way, people will be able to live properly and have disposable income that will trickle down into the economy. The second thing we will do is um, ensure fiscal autonomy of our local governments to ensure that what is supposed to come to the local governments come to them. We will improve the quality of people that, are, that serve in our local governments. We will make them accountable by publishing what comes to them and the people can then hold them accountable and we can use the local governments as development centers. The third thing is a social investment scheme through which we will provide a million naira each for 100 people in every single local gov government of Delta every month in interest-free loans payable over four years for people to start businesses and expand their existing businesses. The first thing is power and gas utilization. Delta State has 40% of Nigeria's gas reserves. So we're going to, the, 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 under that pillar, we would encourage the, the, the we will stop the, um, we'll work with private sector companies to stop flaring of our gas. And then we'll use the gas to ensure we have 24 hour power around Delta State using the concept of distributed generation. The fifth thing is that we would develop 10 new cities across Delta. Now, why would we want to do that? Delta State has become one huge slum. There's no development plan, all right? So we're gonna use those 10 cities, 10 model cities, where you have everything required for model living to attract private sector investment. There will be destination cities with one, 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 um, one attraction, one destination attraction that will attract tourists. There will, have, there will be agro-based industries with internet connectivity and everything that will ensure that people can come to invest. They will have central sewage. Now, the, the fifth thing is social housing. So those cities will come with affordable housing that will ensure people can buy through mortgage financing. And then we will revive our moribund industries and we'll revive our seaports. By the time we do those things, it's a holistic plan that will drive and engender prosperity in Delta State. Okay. Uh, Mr. Campella, you've said a lot. And you want to do a lot for a state that is highly indebted, running into hundreds of billions. Yeah. One, how are you going to get the money for all of this? Two, how much is all of this of your plan going to cost? Three, how are you going to wriggle your way through the fact that some of these things you want to do they are already preset infrastructure on ground because Delta State is a state that enjoys some level of infrastructure. I think it's probably the only state that's got two airports in this country as we speak today. One built by the private sector mm -hmm. in Wari, that used to be formerly Osubi, that Osubi area, Osubi airstrip, and then you've got another one in Asaba. So mm -hmm. those three things. How much is this plan going to cost? How are you going to make the money? How are you going to pay up the death, the debt as regards this? That's all. Okay, let me start with the issue of debt. Now, Delta State is a going concern. In every situation, in, if you take over a company, and I'm, I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm a businessman, have run companies. Now, you take over a company that is indebted, you sit down with your bankers, you look at the debt, and you can restructure the debt, especially when you're able to show them a plan. 
Today, Delta State relies on mainly allocation and IGR. With the plan we have, we're growing a bigger cake that will ensure that what we receive becomes a lot larger. All right, so by the time I sit down with the banks, now we're gonna look at those debts because I'm a banker, all right? My background is banking. And when you give debt, okay, when you give out loans, you really are supposed to take steps to ensure that those debts will be payable. And some of those steps include ensuring that the money goes for what it is intended to, because the money is supposed to help improve the capability of the borrower to pay. In the past few, one year or two years, this de government has taken debt in the twilight of his administration. We're gonna look at some of those debts and determine whether the banks have been negligent in the process of giving out those debts. If, those de if that money was not channeled to the use that it was supposed to, it means the bank is neg negligent. We will not accept those debts. But the ones that are acceptable, we'll sit down with the banks and negotiate them and work out a repayment plan based on the vision that we have and the growth trajectory that we have. The second question you asked is, how do we manage what is this going to be done in relation to the level of infrastructure we have in Delta State? No, and the cost of your, your plan. Besides the the cost of your what plan. The cost. I want to, I'll, I'll come, I'll, I want to I'll know come the cost, to and now you're going to raise the money. Okay, let me deal with that. And first. I still have some input as regards how you're going let, to deal with the debt. Deal with I would like first. to ask you. OK. OK. Now, on the cost, majority of what we're going to do, apart from the the social investment scheme is 120 billion for four years, approximately 30 billion a year. Um, in the 2019 budget of Delta, 2019, yeah, 2019 budget of Delta, we had 30 billion in miscellaneous expenses. Delta State's budget, 200 and over 200 billion, about 60% of it is spent for recurrent expenses. Comparable to Bornu State, that has only about 100 billion for recurrent expenses. We believe that when we cut waste and corruption, we'll be able to take care of the, the things that are directly, the things that are directly attributable to government in my plan are one, um, the, the minimum wage. Two, the social investment scheme, which is a which is a loan that is repayable, is a revolving loan. The other things are things that are, we would attract the private sector to come to De Delta. The, the model cities, now my background is real estate development, one of the things I do. Okay, so what you do is provide the enabling environment, okay, and the basic infrastructure in those model cities that we're talking about that will attract these people to come. Okay, so we believe that it's something that we, it's doable. Now, the, the question about um, the infrastructure. The, the two airports are very good and they, act, they add to the plan that we have. But besides those two airports, our roads are in a shambles, okay? We have one major road leading from where 70% of Delta people stay so the capital city, okay, where the other 30% stay, the Delta North area, where the other 30% stay, that road has been under development for over 20 years. It's not been finished. That shows exactly what our, our infrastructure is across Delta State, okay? Majority of the internal roads are all bad. So it's not true that we have that kind of infrastructure. Besides the two airports, what, what else do we have? Okay. Okay, I mean, uh, Mr. Pella, let me ask you. You are banking on the fact that the yeah. Labour Party did very well in the presidential election of February 25 in Delta State. Did much better than PDP and the APC. And Mr. Peter Obi has been to uh, Delta State uh, to say, according to him, a big, th a big thank you to the people who voted for him and to also uh, campaign for you. But what we're told is that the dynamics may be different on March 18, that you may not, Labour Party may not gain that kind of uh, momentum. Sheriff uh, Oberewori 
of the uh, PDP. Well, he has the incumbency factor uh, behind him. And then, of course, the APC candidate, uh, Ovie Omar Agege, uh, will be capitalizing on the fact that uh, the APC won at the center. So how confident are you that uh, February 25 will be like, uh, you know, uh, March 18? And is it true that the APC has been talking to you to calm down and allow the APC to take victory in a better state? OK, let, let me start with the second part of your question. It's not true that either the APC or the PDP have been talking to me. And even if they tried to, I would not even listen to them. All right? Now, about the dynamics of the coming election and how confident I am, I am very, very, very confident. Yes, I'm banking on the dynamics and the movement, the obedient movement that we have. But there are two other factors we are not considering. The first is that Deltans are yearning for change. Deltans have been yearning for change for almost 24 years, okay? Delta has been going from relatively good to bad to worse. That is how I will, I will categorize the last three administrations that we have. And if we don't take our time, we'll go worse than it. Delta has realized that. And they realize that the two choices they have are Tapia Pia and Sniper. Whichever one you eat, you die. They have tasted the, the PDP for 24 years, and they realize that their lives could be better. They won't change. Everywhere we go, Deltans are crying for change. This is not about the dynamics at the federal level. This is about the fact that the people are tired. Now, the APC, they realize that they've tested the APC for eight years at the federal level, and their lives have gotten worse. But more importantly, Deltans voted overwhelmingly for Peter Obi in the February 25th election. That victory was stolen by the APC. Do you think they will reward them with the state? I doubt it. The sentiments are serious on the ground. We will take our revenge on March the 18th. All right, I, we hear you, Dr. Dikimpela. However, some obedience, or what they call them a faction, have said that they are supporting the APC candidate, Senator Ovie Agege. What, um, Omar Agege, what they've said is that they are the ones in Wari and Asaba are aligning with him, that the obedient movement is independent of the Labour Party, and that even though they massively supported, as um, Dr. Bati mentioned, uh, Mr. Peter will be in the presidential elections, they are supporting and endorsing the APC candidate for governor. What, what's your take on this? What's the confusion there? What's the difference between the obedient movement, Labour Party, as they're saying they're not backing you, they're backing Mr. Um, Senator Ovia Gegin? All right. Um, you're right that there's the Labour Party and there's the obedient, obedient movement. But I'll distinguish further by saying that now the obedient movement is made up of several disparate groups, several groups across the land of people who wanted a change at the national level. Now, even the obedient movement is also made up further of those who are groups and are, you know, pressure groups, basically, support groups, basically, and the people. The obedient movement is a spirit, okay? It's a spirit that's moving across the land. It's a spirit driven by desire for change, desire to save our country and save our land. Now, yes, there are some people who I would rather say that they are more like merchants. They're not true obedient. Because you can't be a true obedient and align with retrogression. You can't be a true obedient looking at the progress of this country and align with people who have ensured that that progress cannot happen by stealing the mandate that was given to your leader. So the people, there are several more. When you have one, you have 10 more of the obedient groups that are working with us and sticking with their true beliefs of being obedient. And then you have the people, the people out there, the people on the streets, the people in the markets, the people in the villages, the people in the farms, they won't change. Those are the true obedience that believe in 
a change in this country that is required by sweeping aside the PDP and the APC. Okay. Those ones are not aligning okay. with anybody else. Okay, let me, let me take you on, on this talk of um, infrastructure and real estates that you want to build and all of that. A lot of people will argue with you that, is that not just missing the case? Because you see, I can call myself proudly a worry boy. And I remember the good old days of the 80s in worry, where there was that economic growth because of the influx of many companies. It was private citizens like the likes of the Mushesheshes or Genevos, and there was, that built estates where those expatriates stayed. And they started the economy of what was real estate. And those estates still last till day. Estates like Jefia and the likes, or Genevo. So isn't it just about ensuring that investment come back? But how would investment come back when there's restiveness? So number one, what would you do about the restive society? And thirdly, you said you will renegotiate right. most Th of the debts. You. Okay. Renegotiate the debt. While you do that, the state continues to suffer. You said you need 120 billion over four years. But you've not told me how you're going to raise that money. I did. I did tell you, Rufai. You, maybe you didn't hear me. I specifically said that by the time we cut waste and corruption, we will have the money to do that. I told you that in 2019, 30 billion was spent on miscellaneous items. What do you mean miscellaneous items? What do they think I can do, all right? When we cut waste and corruption, we, we, do, we do 200 billion plus for recurrent expenditure. When a state like Bonu does 100 billion, it's mismanagement, my brother, all right? We will have the funds to do that. Now, I'm very happy you raised the issue of what worry used to be, okay? I'm glad you did that. Now, that is what we want to take our people back to. We had a state that thrived on private enterprise, all right? That is why we say we want to, re, we want to reorientate the values of our people. We came from that situation years ago to a situation where the way you, you, you know, the only way you could become successful is to be in government, all right? That has to stop, all right? Now, the, 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 the estates we're talking about, the, the cities we're talking about, the, the developing cities will drive our economy. You talk about restiveness. I did say with my plan, enthrone righteousness, create harmony. The create harmony part of our plan entails beefing up security, entails putting in place a very well-equipped state and community policing, all right, that will ensure that, that those kinds of problems do not arise. Youth restiveness will be taken care of by the time the people see the plan. They see where they fit into the plan. They see how they can begin to grow within the plan and how their lives will get better within the plan. We'll take care of youth, youth, youth restiveness. I don't see that as a problem. But the key point is that we want to create an environment where the private sector will be the engine of growth and drive growth and prosperity in Delta states. Dick Impella, how well positioned are you in the power equation in Delta state? Yes, you are robo, you are in the Labour Party, you have the uh, Labour Party momentum behind you, you come from the majority stock, you've taken your running mate from, uh, from uh, the Isoko part, uh, Professor uh, Julio Mokoro, my former... No, she's not Isoko. She's not Isoko. Okay. She's not Isoko. Okay, but... No, she's Undokwa. Undokwa, Professor it's Julie. Undokwa. Okay, Professor Julie Umokoro. Okay, yes. now. But there are some... Uwaboko, Umokoro. There are certain power blocks in that state. Where do you stand in that interface between Chief James Ibori on one hand and also the governor... Uh, Senator Ifani Okowa, on the other hand, and all the other gladiators, because you are talking about change. There's also a battle, it appears, for the soul of Delta State. Where do you stand in all of this? Don't just say you stand with the people. You're right. That uh -huh. there's a battle but there are the power blocks, Delta. yes. <laughs> but, 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 that, but that's the No, truth. no, no, that would be a very convenient people. answer. But, but, but let me address the, the question. No, 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 it, it is convenient, but I won't, I won't stay convenient. But it is the truth. But let me, let, me, let me address, yes, there are power blocks. 
um, there's, there's the, 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 the two key, in quotes, gladiators that you've mentioned. But you know that um, we are all, we were all, I was PDP, all right? And I have, um, I would say that I do not stand with either of the two groups, okay? Because what you have is a situation where um, um, we've had James James Sibori, who did very well for death taxes, relatively well. If you notice, I said good to bad to worse. Now, he had backed um, a fine gentleman, David Ederia, to be governor of Delta State, and that didn't happen. Um, the current governor backed um, Sharif Oborewori um, for you know, the current speaker, and um, that divided the PDP. Now, you have in the APC someone who also came from the PDP, um, um, the current deputy Senate president. Now, in the PDP, I believe that there are several people within the PDP that will support me. I, I am seen in most circles as a compromise candidate. There are several people in the APC who do not want to work with the current deputy Senate president and the current um, candidate of their party. So I believe that I stand very well placed as a compromise between those two gladiators most of the people who are in the PDP that don't want to work you know, with the current governorship candidate and those in the APC that don't want to work with the current governorship candidate, we are already working together. So I stand very, very well pleased. And like you said, I am with the people. And I'm confident that I'm very well pleased and we will win this election. All right, so when we look at, um, thanks for your comments, but when we look at some of the challenges in Delta State, we cannot talk about that without looking at the environment and plans in terms of the re re resurrecting, as it were, um, environments where there have been pollution due to oil spills and the likes. What are your plans for these disadvantaged areas and what would you do to make these areas more prosperous so that they, um, they, they it's reflective of the oil richness of that place. Okay, now, um, if you notice, I talked about power and gas utilization. That's one of the key prosperity drivers. Um, gas flaring is one of the biggest problems that we have in Delta in terms of pollution. So we're gonna work with the, other, uh, the oil companies and other private sector players to bring in industries that will utilize the gases and ensure that we don't continue to have um, gas flaring. We're going to work with the oil industries to, you know, in, in respect to oil spillage. But this is one of the reasons we are looking at the 10 cities. 10 cities, one in each federal constituency. Those cities are going to drive, you know, begin the process of modernizing and, and, and basically, um, um, you know, Developing, developing a state around a development plan that would ensure growth through those places. Now, we believe that when we are able to work on those model cities and those start, we can then begin to, um, so, so take, um, take my local, my, my federal constituency, for example, the Ugeli Udu federal constituency. We are looking at a place we will call Otorupe, all right? And Otorupe simply means the land of light. That, and, and that's where Otorobu gas plant is, utilizing the gas resources there to drive the process of electricity. And then, again, we'll work with the oil companies to ensure that those areas that have pollution and all that will stop. That whole plan that we have is to improve and drive the prosperity of our people across the land. OK, what will you do with the sopa deck? The sopa deck looks. Moribund, punching below his weight as we speak today. The SOPA deck has become a poster child for everything wrong in Delta. What would you do as regards the SOPA deck? You're very right about the SOPA deck being everything wrong in Delta. Cesspool of corruption. Um, it's abandoned this mandate. It's using the funds that are rightly for, meant for the development of the oil producing areas. It's using it for God knows what. We will ensure that it is properly reorganized and it will be able to drive what it was meant to do. I remember when the Sopadec first started, they had a lot of projects that they were doing 
in the oil producing areas. Okay, we're going to restore the super deck to what it's supposed to do. The funds, I mean, you notice I, I am big on accountability. I'm big on transparency. I'm big on eliminating waste and corruption. That is what we're going to ensure goes into the super deck. It's already an establishment established by law for the purpose of driving development across the oil producing areas. It will be made to fulfill its mandate. The funds that come in for it will go to it and it will be used for what it's meant to do. Dick Impella, some of your critics say you are a Lagos man. That you are so well established in Lagos. This is just another case of a Lagos landlord coming to Delta saying uh, he wants to come and be governor. How well do you in fact know this Delta state that you want to govern? Okay, okay. I, yes, I live in Lagos, but I have been involved in Delta for the last 22, 24 years. I established the first and only bank in my local government in 1992, right? And I was regularly at home till I ran for local government chairman in my state, in my local government in the year 2000, 22 years ago, all right? And this system that we've had in place um, for the last 24 years, even though I won my primaries, didn't allow me to become chairman of my local government. Since then, I've remained in the political equation of the state. I, so I'm not someone who just came in from Lagos. I have been involved in the state. So I am not someone who just came in from Lagos. I, I have been involved in development in my area. I've been involved in development across the state. I've been involved in the political equation. So I'm not just a Lagos person. Yes, I live in Lagos. Okay, my family lives in Lagos. You would live somewhere before you go and do something somewhere else. But that in itself could be an advantage because I'm bringing a new perspective. Part of our problem is that we've been ingrown. We've been ingrown with a local mindset and a local mentality. We've got to change it. We've got to bring development to our place. And that mindset that I'm going to bring will make a difference to our people. All right, so in the, in the next elections, as you have also alluded to, the focus and, of course, attention young people, the youth. And if you're also banking on the obedient movement, like you said you know, in, on the, in, in this interview, then you would also understand the importance of catering to the needs of the young people in Delta State. The number of issues plague them, unemployment, um, being able to upskill them. What are some of your plans for young people? And maybe may I add to that list women in Delta State, should you become governor? When I become governor. All right. Um, I'm big on the youth. I, I became, I graduated at 19. I became a chief executive at 25. All right. Now, I, I have, I, I, I believe that my best, the best I gave to my business and to my country and to my state, to my local government was when I was younger. I'm not as agile as I was. My daughter, um, became chief operating officer of, of my company at 22, 23. That, that's the kind of confidence I have in the youth. The youths are going to be big in my government, okay? Because I know, I know the kind of zeal that they have. I know the kind of zeal I had when I was much younger. I still have it, but I'm not, I don't have the energy that they have. So the youths are going to be big in my government. But more importantly, as to the plans I have for the youth, if we look at my holistic plan, the, the youth and the women, the social investment scheme will be primarily targeted at the youth and the women. They will be, you know, they, besides giving them funding, they will be giving them entrepreneurship training. They will be giving them the kinds of skills that are required to manage the investment that's been given to them. All right, and we believe that by the time we do this, okay, it will drive the process of, of, of um, um, entrepreneurship across the land. And a lot of these youth will become employers of labor. That will you know, go a long way in ensuring that our youth have jobs. The, the whole plan, developing 10 new cities, what that will do to stimulate our economy in terms of employment is huge. 
reviving our moribund industries is all talking about employment. I am not big on handouts. I don't want to do handouts. I want to, I want to empower our people with the skills and the resources to be able to be their own people and be their own, I mean, to be their own leaders and to be able to grow the economy. So that's our plan for the use. We're big on women. That's why I picked a woman as my deputy governor. All right, and you know, she will tell you that between her and my wife, we'll ensure women have their pride of place in Delta State. Well, Dickie Campella, we would like to thank you very much for joining us, and we wish you all the best as uh, you know, Delta State goes to the polls on March 18. We take a short break now, and when we return, we'll be talking to our next guest, Mr. Peter Obi, presidential candidate.